everyone. Today, the bookworms are going to read Charlotte's Web from Chapter Number Nine, written by A. B. White and pictures by Garth Williams. Let's begin. Chapter Number Nine, Wilbur's Boast. A spider's web is stronger than it looks. Although it is made of thin, delicate strands, the web is not easily broken. However, a web gets torn every day by the insects that kick around in it, and a spider must rebuild it when it gets full of holes. Charlotte liked to do her weaving during the late afternoon, and Fern liked to sit nearby and watch. One afternoon. She heard a most interesting conversation and witnessed a strange event. "You have awfully hairy legs, Charlotte," said Wilbur, as the spider busily worked at her task. "My legs are hairy for a good reason," replied Charlotte. "Furthermore, each leg of mine has seven sections: the coxa, the trochanter, the femur, the patella, the tibia, the metatarsus, and the tarsus." Wilbur sat bolt upright. "You're kidding," he said. "No, I'm not either." "Say those names again. I didn't catch them the first time." "Coxa, trochanter, femur, patella, tibia, metatarsus, and tarsus." "Goodness," said Wilbur, looking down at his own chubby legs. "I don't think my legs have seven sections." "Well," said Charlotte, "you and I lead different lives." You don't have to spin a web. That takes real leg work. I could spin a web if I tried," said Wilbur, boasting. "I've just never tried." "Let's see you do it," said Charlotte. Fern chuckled softly, and her eyes grew wide with love for the pig. "Okay," replied Wilbur. "You coach me, and I'll spin one. It must be a lot of fun to spin a web. How do I start?" Take a deep breath," said Charlotte, smiling. Wilbur breathed deeply. Now climb to the highest place you can get to, like this. Charlotte raced up to the top of the doorway. Wilbur scrambled to the top of the manure pile. Very good," said Charlotte. Now make an attachment with your spinnerets, hurl yourself into space, and let out a drag line as you go down. Wilbur hesitated a moment. Then jumped out into the air. He glanced hastily behind to see if a piece of rope was following him to check his fall, but nothing seemed to be happening in his rear. And the next thing he knew, he landed with a thump. Oomph! He grunted. Charlotte laughed so hard her web began to sway. What did I do wrong? Asked the pig when he recovered from his bump. Nothing, said Charlotte. It was a nice try. I think I'll try again," said Wilbur cheerfully. "I believe what I need is a little piece of string to hold me." The pig walked out to his yard. "You there, Templeton?" he called. The rat poked his head out from under the trow. "Got a little piece of string I could borrow?" asked Wilbur. "I need it to spin a web." "Yes, indeed," replied Templeton, who saved string. "No trouble at all. Anything to oblige." He crept down into his hole, pushed the goose egg out of the way, and returned with an old piece of dirty white string. Wilbur examined it. "That's just the thing," he said. "Tie one end to my tail, will you, Templeton?" Wilbur crouched low with his thin, curly tail toward the rat. Templeton seized the string, passed it around the end of the pig's tail, and tied two half hitches. Charlotte watched in delight. Like Fern, she was truly fond of Wilbur, whose smelly pen and stale food attracted the flies that she needed, and she was proud to see that he was not a quitter and was willing to try again to spin a web. While the rat and the spider and the little girl watched, Wilbur climbed again to the top of the manure pile, full of energy and hope. Everybody, watch! He cried, and summoning all his strength, he threw himself into the air head first. The string trailed behind him, but as he had neglected to fasten the other end to anything, it didn't really do any good, and Wilbur landed with a thud, crushed and hurt. Tears came to his eyes. Templeton grinned. Charlotte just sat quietly. After a bit, she spoke. 
You can't spin a web, Wilbur, and I advise you to put the idea out of your mind. You lack two things needed for spinning a web. What are they? asked Wilbur sadly. You lack a set of spinnerets, and you lack know how. But cheer up! You don't need a web. Zuckerman supplies you with three big meals a day. Why should you worry about trapping food? Wilbur sighed. You're ever so much cleverer and brighter than I am, Charlotte. I guess I was just trying to show off. Serves me right. Templeton united his string and took it back to his home. Charlotte returned to her weaving. You needn't feel too badly, Wilbur. She said. Not many creatures can spin webs. Even men aren't as good at it as spiders, although they think they're pretty good, and they'll try anything. Did you ever hear of the Queensboro Bridge? Wilbur shook his head. Is it a web? Sort of, replied Charlotte. But did you know how long it took men to build it? Eight whole years. My goodness, I would have starved to death waiting that long. I can make a web in a single evening. What do people catch in the Queensboro Bridge? Bugs? Asked Wilbur. No, said Charlotte. They don't catch anything. They just keep trotting back and forth across the bridge, thinking there is something better on the other side. If they'd hang head down at the top of the thing and wait quietly, maybe something good would come along. But no, with men it's rush, rush, rush every minute. I'm glad I'm a sedentary spider. What does sedentary mean? Asked Wilbur. Means I sit still a good part of the time and don't go wandering all over creation. I know a good thing when I see it, and my web is a good thing. I stay put and wait for what comes. Gives me a chance to think. Well, I'm sort of sedentary myself, I guess," said the pig. "I have to hang around here whether I want to or not. You know where I'd really like to be this evening? Where?" In a forest, looking for beech nuts, and truffles, and delectable roots, pushing leaves aside with my wonderful strong nose, searching and sniffing along the ground, smelling, smelling, smelling. You smell just the way you are," remarked a lamb who had just walked in. "I can smell you from here. You're the smelliest creature in the place." Wilbur hung his head. His eyes grew wet with tears. Charlotte noticed his embarrassment, and she spoke sharply to the lamb. "Let Wilbur alone," she said. "He has a perfect right to smell, considering his surroundings. You're no bundle of sweet peas yourself. Furthermore, you are interrupting a very pleasant conversation. What were we talking about, Wilbur, when we were so rudely interrupted? Oh, I don't remember," said Wilbur. "It doesn't make any difference." Let's not talk any more for a while, Charlotte. I'm getting sleepy. You go ahead and finish fixing your web, and I'll just lie here and watch you. It's a lovely evening. Wilbur stretched out on his side. Twilight settled over Zuckerman's barn, and a feeling of peace. Fern knew it was almost supper time, but she couldn't bear to leave. Swallows passed on silent wings, in and out of the doorways, bringing food to their young ones. From across the road, a bird sang. Whippoorwill, whippoorwill. Larvy sat down under an apple tree and lit his pipe. The animal sniffed the familiar smell of strong tobacco. Wilbur heard the trill of the tree toad, and the occasional slamming of the kitchen door. All these sounds made him feel comfortable and happy, for he loved life and loved to be a part of the world on a summer evening. But as he lay there, he remembered what the old sheep had told him. The thought of death came to him, and he began to tremble with fear. Charlotte, he said softly, "Yes, Wilbur, I don't want to die." Of course you don't," said Charlotte in a comforting voice. "I just love it here in the barn," said Wilbur. "I love everything about this place." "Of course you do," said Charlotte. "We all do." The goose appeared, followed by her seven gooselings. They thrust their little necks out and kept up a musical whistling, like a tiny troop of pipers. Wilbur listened to the sound with love in his heart. Charlotte, he said. Yes, said the spider. Were you serious when you promised you would keep them from killing me?
I was never more serious in my life. I am not going to let you die, Wilbur. How are you going to save me? asked Wilbur, whose curiosity was very strong on this point. Well, said Charlotte vaguely, I don't really know, but I'm working on a plan. That's wonderful, said Wilbur. How is the plan coming, Charlotte? Have you got very far with it? Is it coming along pretty well? Wilbur was trembling again, but Charlotte was cool and collected. Oh, it's coming all right, she said lightly. The plan is still in its early stages and hasn't completely shaped up yet, but I'm working on it. When do you work on it? begged Wilbur. When I'm hanging head down at the top of my web. That's when I do my thinking, because then all the blood is in my head. I'd be only too glad to help in any way I can. Oh, I'll work it out alone, said Charlotte. I can think better if I think alone. All right, said Wilbur. But don't fail to let me know if there's anything I can do to help, no matter how slight. Well, replied Charlotte, you must try to build yourself up. I want you to get plenty of sleep and stop worrying. Never hurry and never worry. Chew your food thoroughly and eat every bit of it, except you must leave just enough for Templeton. Gain weight and stay well. That's the way you can help. Keep fit and don't lose your nerve. Do you think you understand? Yes, I understand, said Wilbur. Go along to bed then, said Charlotte. Sleep is important. Wilbur trotted over to the darkest corner of his pen and threw himself down. He closed his eyes. In another minute, he spoke. Charlotte, he said. Yes, Wilbur. May I go out to my tro and see if I left any of my supper? I think I left just a tiny bit of mashed potato. Very well, said Charlotte, but I want you in bed again without delay. Wilbur started to race out to his yard. Slowly, slowly, said Charlotte. Never hurry and never worry. Wilbur checked himself and crept slowly to his tro. He found a bit of potato, chewed it carefully, swallowed it, and walked back to bed. He closed his eyes and was silent for a while. Charlotte? he said in a whisper. Yes? May I get a drink of milk? I think there are a few drops of milk left in my tro. No, the tro is dry and I want you to go to sleep. No more talking. Close your eyes and go to sleep. Wilbur shut his eyes. Fern got up from her stool and started for home, her mind full of everything she had seen and heard. Good night, Charlotte, said Wilbur. Good night, Wilbur. There was a pause. Good night, Charlotte. Good night, Wilbur. Good night. Good night. Chapter 10 An Explosion Day after day, the spider waited, head down, for an idea to come to her. Hour by hour, she sat motionless, deep in thought. Having promised Wilbur that she would save his life, she was determined to keep her promise. Charlotte was naturally patient. She knew from experience that if she waited long enough, a fly would come to her web, and she felt sure that if she thought long enough about Wilbur's problem, an idea would come to her mind. Finally, one morning, toward the middle of July, the idea came. Why, how perfectly simple, she said to herself. The way to save Wilbur's life is to play a trick on Zuckerman. If I can fool a bug, thought Charlotte, I can surely fool a man. People are not as smart as bugs. Wilbur walked into his yard just at that moment. What are you thinking about, Charlotte? he asked. I was just thinking, said the spider, that people are very gullible. What does gullible mean? Easy to fool, said Charlotte. That's a mercy, replied Wilbur, and he lay down in the shade of his fence and went fast asleep. The spider, however, stayed wide awake, gazing affectionately at him and making plans for his future. Summer was half gone. She knew she didn't have much time. That morning, just as Wilbur fell asleep, Avery Arable wandered into Zuckerman's front yard, followed by Fern. Avery carried a live frog in his hand. Fern had a crown of daisies in her hair. The children ran for the kitchen. Just in time for a piece of blueberry pie, said Mrs. Zuckerman. Look at my frog, said Avery, placing the frog on the drain board and holding out his hand for pie. 
Take that thing out of here, said Mrs. Zuckerman. He's hot, said Fern. He's almost dead, that frog. He is not, said Avery. He lets me scratch him between the eyes. The frog jumped and landed in Mrs. Zuckerman's dishpan full of soapy water. You're getting your pie on you, said Fern. Can I look for eggs in the hen house, Aunt Edith? Run outdoors, both of you, and don't bother the hens. It's getting all over everything, shouted Fern. His pie is all over his front. Come on, frog, cried Avery. He scooped up his frog. The frog kicked, splashing soapy water onto the blueberry pie. Another crisis, groaned Fern. Let's swing in the swing, said Avery. The children ran to the barn. Mr. Zuckerman had the best swing in the country. It was a single long piece of heavy rope tied to the beam over the north doorway. At the bottom end of the rope was a fat knot to sit on. It was arranged so that you could swing without being pushed. You climbed a ladder to the hayloft. Then, holding the rope, you stood at the edge and looked down, and were scared and dizzy. Then you straddled the knot so that it acted as a seat. Then you got up all your nerve, took a deep breath, and jumped. For a second, you seemed to be falling to the barn floor far below. But then suddenly the rope would begin to catch you, and you would sail through the barn door, going a mile a minute, with the wind whistling in your eyes and ears and hair. Then you would zoom upward into the sky and look up at the clouds, and the rope would twist and you would twist and turn with the rope. Then you would drop down, 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 out of the sky, and come sailing back into the barn, almost into the hayloft. Then sail out again, not quite so far this time, then in again, not quite so high, then out again, then in again, then out, then in, and then you'd jump off and fall down and let somebody else try it. Mothers for miles around worried about Zuckerman's swing. They feared some child would fall off, but no child ever did. Children almost always hang on to things tighter than their parents think they will. Avery put the frog in his pocket and climbed to the hayloft. The last time I swang in the swing, I almost crashed into a barn swallow, he yelled. Take that frog out, ordered Fern. Avery straddled the rope and jumped. He sailed out through the door, frog and all, and into the sky, frog and all. Then he sailed back into the barn. Your tongue is purple, screamed Fern. So is yours, cried Avery, sailing out again with the frog. I have hay inside my dress. It itches, called Fern. Scratch it, yelled Avery as he sailed back. It's my turn, said Fern. Jump off. Fern's got the itch, sang Avery. When he jumped off, he threw the swing up to his sister. She shut her eyes tight and jumped. She felt the dizzy drop, then the supporting lift of the swing. When she opened her eyes, she was looking up into the blue sky and was about to fly back through the door. They took turns for an hour. When the children grew tired of swinging, they went down to where the pasture and picked wild raspberries and ate them. Their tongues turned from purple to red. Fern bit into a raspberry that had a bad tasting bug inside it and got discouraged. Avery found an empty candy box and put his frog in it. The frog seemed tired after his morning in the swing. The children walked slowly up toward the barn. They, too, were tired and hardly had energy enough to walk. Let's build a tree house, suggested Avery. I want to live in a tree with my frog. I'm going to visit Wilbur, Fern announced. They climbed the fence into the lane and walked lazily toward the pig pen. Wilbur heard them coming and got up. Avery noticed the spider web, and coming closer, he saw Charlotte. Hey, look at that big spider, he said. It's tremendous! Leave it alone, commanded Fern. You've got a frog, isn't that enough? That's a fine spider, and I'm going to capture it, said Avery. He took the cover off the candy box, then he picked up a stick. I'm going to knock that old spider into this box, he said. Wilbur's heart almost stopped when he saw what was going on. This might be the end of Charlotte if the boy succeeded in catching her. You stop it, Avery! cried Fern. Avery put one leg over the fence of the pig pen. He was just about to raise his stick to hit Charlotte when he lost his balance. He swayed and toppled and landed on the edge of Wilbur's trough. 
The trow tipped up and then came down with a slap. The goose egg was right underneath. There was a dull explosion as the egg broke, and then a horrible smell. Fern screamed. Avery jumped to his feet. The air was filled with the terrible gases and smells from the rotten egg. Templeton, who had been resting in his home, scuttled away into the barn. Good night, screamed Avery. Good night. What a stink. Let's get out of here. Fern was crying. She held her nose and ran toward the house. Avery ran after her, holding his nose. Charlotte felt greatly relieved to see him go. It had been a narrow escape. Later on that morning, the animals came up from the pasture. The sheep, the lambs, the gander, the goose, and the seven gooselings. There were many complaints about that awful smell, and Wilbur had to tell the story over and over again of how the arable boy had tried to capture Charlotte and how the smell of the broken egg drove him away just in time. It was that rotten goose egg that saved Charlotte's life, said Wilbur. The goose was proud of her share in the adventure. I'm delighted that the egg never hatched, she gabbled. Templeton, of course, was miserable over the loss of his beloved egg, but he couldn't resist boasting. It pays to save things, he said in his surly voice. A rat never knows when something is going to come in handy. I never throw anything away. Well, said one of the lambs, this whole business is all well and good for Charlotte, but what about the rest of us? The smell is unbearable. Who wants to live in a barn that is perfumed with rotten egg? Don't worry, you'll get used to it, said Templeton. He sat up and pulled wisely at his long whiskers, then crept away to pay a visit to the dump. When Lurvy showed up at lunchtime, carrying a pail of food for Wilbur, he stopped short a few paces from the pig pen. He sniffed the air and made a face. What in thunder, he said. Setting the pail down, he picked up the stick that Avery had dropped and pried the trow up. Rats, he said. Phew! I might have known a rat would make a nest under his trow. How I hate a rat! And Lurvy dragged Wilbur's trow across the yard and kicked some dirt into the rat's nest, burying the broken egg and all Templeton's other possessions. Then he picked up the pail. Wilbur stood in the trow, drooling with hunger. Lurvy poured. The slops ran creamily down around the pig's eyes and ears. Wilbur grunted. He gulped and sucked and sucked and gulped, making swishing and swooshing noises, anxious to get everything at once. It was a delicious meal. Skim milk, wheat middlings, leftover pancakes, half a donut, the rind of a summer squash, two pieces of stale toast, a third of a ginger snap, a fish tail, one orange peel, several noodles from a noodle soup, the scum of a cup of cocoa, an ancient jelly roll, a strip of paper from the lining of the garbage pail, and a spoonful of raspberry jello. Wilbur ate heartily. He planned to leave half a noodle and a few drops of milk for Templeton. Then he remembered that the rat had been useful in saving Charlotte's life, and that Charlotte was trying to save his life, so he left a whole noodle instead of a half. Now that the broken egg was buried, the air cleared and the barn smelled good again. The afternoon passed and evening came. Shadows lengthened. The cool and kindly breath of evening entered through the doors and windows. Astride her web, Charlotte sat moodily eating a horsefly and thinking about the future. After a while, she bestirred herself. She descended to the center of the web and there she began to cut some of her lines. She worked slowly but steadily while the other creatures drowsed. None of the others, not even the goose, noticed that she was at work. Deep in a soft bed, Wilbur snoozed. Over in their favorite corner, the gooselings whistled a night song. Charlotte tore quite a section out of her web, leaving an open space in the middle. Then she started weaving something to take the place of the threads she had removed. When Templeton got back from the dump around midnight, the spider was still at work. Chapter 11. The Miracle The next day was foggy. Everything on the farm was dripping wet. The grass looked like a magic carpet. The asparagus patch looked like a silver forest. On foggy mornings, Charlotte's web was truly a thing of beauty. 
This morning, each thin strand was decorated with dozens of tiny beads of water. The web glistened in the light and made a pattern of loveliness and mystery, like a delicate veil. Even Lurvy, who wasn't particularly interested in beauty, noticed the web when he came with the pig's breakfast. He noted how clearly it showed up, and he noted how big and carefully built it was. And then he took another look, and he saw something that made him set his pail down. There, in the center of the web, neatly woven in block letters, was a message. It said, "Some pig." Lurvy felt weak. He brushed his hand across his eyes and stared harder at Charlotte's web. "I'm seeing things," he whispered. He dropped down to his knees and uttered a short prayer. Then, forgetting all about Wilbur's breakfast, he walked back to the house and called Mister Zuckerman. "I think you'd better come down to the pig pen," he said. "What's the trouble?" asked Mister Zuckerman. "Anything wrong with the pig?" "Not exactly," said Lurvy. "Come and see for yourself." The two men walked silently down to Wilbur's yard. Lurvy pointed to the spider's web. Do you see what I see? He asked. Zuckerman stared at the writing on the web. Then he murmured the words "some pig." Then he looked at Lurvy. Then they both began to tremble. Charlotte, sleepy after her night's exertion, smiled as she watched. Wilbur came and stood directly under the web. "Some pig," muttered Lurvy in a low voice. "Some pig," whispered Mister Zuckerman. They stared and stared for a long time at Wilbur. Then they stared at Charlotte. "You don't suppose that that spider," began Mister Zuckerman, but he shook his head and didn't finish the sentence. Instead, he walked solemnly back up to the house and spoke to his wife, Edith. Something has happened," he said in a weak voice. He went into the living room and sat down, and Mrs. Zuckerman followed. "I've got something to tell you, Edith," he said. "You better sit down." Mrs. Zuckerman sank into a chair. She looked pale and frightened. "Edith," he said, trying to keep his voice steady, "I think you had best be told that we have a very unusual pig." A look of complete bewilderment came over Mrs. Zuckerman's face. "Homer Zuckerman, what in the world are you talking about?" she said. "This is a very serious thing, Edith," he replied. Our pig is completely out of the ordinary. What's unusual about the pig? Asked Mrs. Zuckerman, who was beginning to recover from her scare. Well, I don't really know yet," said Mr. Zuckerman, "but we have received a sign, Edith, a mysterious sign. A miracle has happened on this farm. There's a large spider's web in the doorway of the barn cellar, right over the pig pen. And when Lurvy went to feed the pig this morning, he noticed the web because it was foggy. And you know how a spider's web looks very distinct in a fog. And right, spang in the middle of the web, were the words "some pig." The words were woven right into the web. They were actually part of the web, Edith. I know because I have been down there and seen them. It says "some pig" just as clear as clear can be. There can be no mistake about it. A miracle has happened, and a sign has occurred here on Earth, right on our farm. And we have no ordinary pig. Well," said Mrs. Zuckerman, "it seems to me you're a little off. It seems to me we have no ordinary spider." "Oh no," said Zuckerman, "it's the pig that's unusual. It says so, right there in the middle of the web." "Maybe so," said Mrs. Zuckerman. "Just the same, I intend to have a look at that spider." "It's just a common gray spider," said Zuckerman. They got up. And together they walked down to Wilbur's yard. You see, Edith, it's just a common gray spider. Wilbur was pleased to receive so much attention. Lurvy was still standing there, and Mister and Missus Zuckerman, all three, stood for about an hour reading the words on the web over and over, and watching Wilbur. Charlotte was delighted with the way her trick was working. She sat without moving a muscle, and listened to the conversation of the people. When a small fly blundered into the web, just beyond the word "pig," Charlotte dropped quickly down, rolled the fly up, and carried it out of the way. After a while, the fog lifted, the web dried off, and the words didn't show up so plainly. The Zuckermans and Lurvy walked back to the house. 
Just before they left the pig pen, Mr. Zuckerman took one last look at Wilbur. You know, he said, in an important voice, I've thought all along that that pig of ours was an extra good one. He's a solid pig. That pig is as solid as they come. You notice how solid he is around the shoulders, Lurvy? Sure, sure I do, said Lurvy. I've always noticed that pig. He's quite a pig. He's long and he's smooth, said Zuckerman. That's right, agreed Lurvy. He's as smooth as they come. He's some pig. When Mr. Zuckerman got back to the house, he took off his work clothes and put on his best suit. Then he got into his car and drove to the minister's house. He stayed for an hour and explained to the minister that a miracle had happened on the farm. So far, said Zuckerman, only four people on earth know about this miracle. Myself, my wife Edith, my hired man Lurvy, and you. Don't tell anybody else, said the minister. We don't know what it means yet, but perhaps if I give thought to it, I can explain it in my sermon next Sunday. There can be no doubt that you have a most unusual pig. I intend to speak about it in my sermon and point out the fact that this community has been visited with a wondrous animal. By the way, does the pig have a name? Why, yes, says Mr. Zuckerman. My little niece calls him Wilbur. She's a rather queer child full of notions. She raised the pig on a bottle and I brought him from her when he was a month old. He shook hands with the minister and left. Secrets are hard to keep. Long before Sunday came, the news spread all over the county. Everybody knew that a sign had appeared in a spider's web on the Zuckerman place. Everybody knew that the Zuckermans had a wondrous pig. People came from miles around to look at Wilbur and to read the words on Charlotte's web. The Zuckerman's driveway was full of cars and trucks from morning till night. Fords and Chevys and Buick Roadmasters and GMC pickups. And Plymouths and Studebakers and Packards and DeSotos with aromatic transmissions and Oldsmobiles with rocket engines and Jeep station wagons and Pontiacs. The news of the wonderful pig spread clear up into the hills and farmers came rattling down in buggies and buckboards to stand hour after hour at Wilbur's pen admiring the miraculous animal. All said they had never seen such a pig before in their lives. When Fern told her mother that Avery had tried to hit the Zuckerman spider with a stick, Mrs. Arable was so shocked that she sent Avery to bed without any supper as punishment. In the days that followed, Mr. Zuckerman was so busy entertaining visitors that he neglected his farm work. He wore his good clothes all the time now, got right into them when he got up in the morning. Mrs. Zuckerman prepared special meals for Wilbur. Lurvy shaved and got a haircut, and his principal farm duty was to feed the pig while people looked on. Mr. Zuckerman ordered Lurvy to increase Wilbur's feedings from three meals a day to four meals a day. The Zuckermans were so busy with visitors, they forgot about other things on the farm. The blackberries got ripe, and Mrs. Zuckerman failed to put up any blackberry jam. The corn needed hoeing, and Lurvy didn't find time to hoe it. On Sunday, the church was full. The minister explained the miracle. He said that the words on the spider's web proved that human beings must always be on the watch for the coming of wonders. All in all, the Zuckerman's pig pen was a center of attraction. Fern was happy, for she felt that Charlotte's trick was working and that Wilbur's life would be saved. But she found that the barn was not nearly as pleasant too many people. She liked it better when she could be all alone with her friends, the animals. Well, that's it for today, everyone. I hope you enjoyed. Thank you for listening. Bye!